Shalom Aleichem, Happy Sukkot, Happy Holidays. Today on the day of Hoshana Rabbah, we are learning Parashat Vizdota Bracha in preparation for um, Simchat Torah when we are going to read the Torah portion Vizdota Bracha, the last Torah portion of the entire cycle. And we are on page 1113 of the art school of Humash. And <clears throat> this Parsha is, of course, the last day of Moshe Rabbeinu's life. And he is, after having rebuked the Jewish people for 40 years, and especially in the last mm -hmm. month, the Jewish people heard from Moshe so many times what they have done wrong. Now, finally, Moshe is blessing them. And these blessings are beautiful, they are prophetic, and the commentators compare these blessings to the blessings that Yaakov gave to his sons in uh, Parshat Vayechi, before he died. Many um, symbolic references, many parallels are drawn. Anyone who has the time is encouraged to read the blessings that Yaakov gave to his sons and compare them to the blessings that Moshe gave to the 12 tribes. Now, chapter 33, verse 1. And this is the blessing that Moshe, the man of God, bestowed upon the children of Israel before his death. Moshe is called the man of God, or in Hebrew, Ish HaElokim. Ish HaElokim means either the man of God or godly man. Man of God means that he is devoted to Hashem, means that he is a servant of Hashem, the man that belongs to God. That certainly is a good description of Moshe. According to the other reading, Ish HaElokim means he is a godly man. He is more than a regular human being. He is somewhere between a human being and an angel. As the sages say, Moshe, from his waist down, was a human being. He had to eat, digest, go to the bathroom. However, from his waist up, he was an angel. And this is something that is um, available to all of us. Uh, we can attain it by controlling our desires, exhibiting self-control in all areas, in all our um, character traits. When our mind is in control of our heart and our emotions, our thoughts, our desires, we become purely logical being like God himself. And we only use love when it's necessary. We use kindness when it's necessary. We use strict justice when it's necessary. We use self-control when it's necessary. Everything we do is measured. Then we become that, that um, perfect, wholesome individual, that ultimate human being that Moshe Rabin was able to reach. And that is the second explanation. Mm. What does it mean? Moshe is the man of God or he is a godly man. And of course, on the last day of his life, that is the level that he reached. And we hope that on the last day of our life, we also will reach this lofty level or at least something very close to it that we can look back at our life and say, yes, my life, I devoted to Hashem. I am servant of Hashem. I am the man that, who belongs in his entirety to God. And we can look at our uh, being and we can say, I became more divine rather than animalistic. 
I took control of my body. I trained my body. I made my body into an angel. And in fact, that is what our job is. When the Jewish people take a piece of lettuce, something that grows from the ground, something that is plant uh, being, it is on uh, almost the lowest level. The lowest level is inanimate object like stones and um, sand and uh, clouds and, and water. Then you have plant uh, beings. They have some kind of uh, spiritual um, existence because otherwise they wouldn't be able to grow. Then you have a higher level animals. They have a higher soul. They have an intellect. They may have some emotions. Then higher than that, you have a human being. And higher than that, there are two more levels. There is a, a Jew who is dedicated to Hashem. He has a higher soul. And then you have an angel who is very close to Hashem. And we, the, the people, we are composed of the part that is like an animal, our body, and the part that is like an angel, our soul. And depending on what we emphasize, that's what we become. If we emphasize our animalistic part, our body, we adore it, we clothe it, we bathe it, we uh, pamper it, we uh, put a lot of um, effort into giving our, uh, our body pleasure, then we become more body-like. We become more physical. We become more animalistic. We strengthen the power of the body. Mm -hmm. But if we strengthen our spiritual side, if we work on our soul, if we think about our soul, the fact that we have a soul, and what does it mean? Connection to Hashem, infinite potential, and we act accordingly, then we become more spiritual, we become more angel-like, angelic. Now, when we consume a plant, we raise the human level. Why? Because we take something that is plant material and we incorporate it into a human being. It becomes part of us. Now, if we use the energy that the plant gives us, we use it for spiritual pursuits, then we make the plant into a human How, uh, and maybe even into an angel. However, if we take the plant material and we do basic routine, running around, working, eating, reproducing, sleeping, then we're using the plant for animalistic functions. So yes, it's still good for the plant to be consumed by a human if the human is using it well, even for animalistic functions, but animalistic functions are also necessary then the plant grows in its spiritual dimension and becomes part of an animal body. The human body, part of a human, and that is animalistic. However, there is another level that if a human being consumes the plant, the energy from the plant, and uses it for sins, for rebelling against God, for evil, then we damage the spiritual energy that's in the plant and we bring it down. And there's a concept that even a human being and certainly whatever we eat, if we misuse it, becomes inanimate. It goes down from being a human into an animal. Then it goes down to being a plant and then it goes down to being an inanimate object. As we have a concept that a human being can be reincarnated, the soul of a human being can be put into an inanimate object because 
he used his body to such an extent for evil that it, he brought it down to animal level. And then even worse to plant level and then even worse to inanimate object. <clears throat> so anything we use in this world, we can uplift whether it is plant material, animal, like what we eat, and even inanimate objects. We take water, we take salt, we take uh, minerals, and we even use stones for building a building, a house. And then if we use the chair we sit on, the table, the bed, the house for spiritual um, endeavors, we use it to come closer to God, to do the will of God, then all these uh, physical objects become servants of a human being and therefore they become servants of God. And therefore they are upraised, they fulfill their mission and they may receive a, a higher spiritual um, existence. So we call Moshe man of God or godly man anything he touches becomes godly and of course being that he was our leader any Jew that he looked at became a better Jew any Jew that he spoke with became a better Jew any Jew that he blessed became a, a Jew with a, with, a, with a capital J and that is why it's important to read these blessings because words of a tzaddik, words of a righteous man have an effect. And words of Moshe, especially the words of blessing, have an effect. And as we read them, we imagine how he says it to us. And the blessings that he said to the tribes, they come to us. As um, Rashi, the commentator, says that at the end of his blessings to each tribe, he put them all together and said, all the blessings I said to Ruven should apply to all tribes, all the Jewish people. All the blessings that I said to Shimon should, should apply to all the Jewish people. All the blessings I said to each one of the tribes should apply to all the Jewish people for all generations to come. So this is the blessing that Moshe gave the children of Israel before his death. He said, first, a little bit of history that describes why Jewish people are special, why they deserve the blessing. Hashem came from Sinai to greet the Jewish people as they were coming to Sinai, as the Chatan, as the groom comes to greet the Kala, the bride. As we, we know in a Sephardic tradition, when the bride with her parents comes towards the chuppah, the groom leaves the chuppah and walks towards the bride. And he meets her halfway, and then they um, together go back to the chuppah. So Hashem came from Sinai. The Jewish people are going to the Mount Sinai to receive the Torah, and they see Hashem is greeting them. Having shown forth to them from Seir. Now, an interesting thing Moshe says, Hashem came from Sinai, but where did he come from to Sinai? He came from the mountain of Seir. What was he doing there? He was first visiting Seir, then he came to Sinai. We know that Seir is the uh, land where Esav lived. That means Hashem came from Esav to the Mount Sinai to give Torah to the Jewish people. Why did he go to Esav first? And uh, the, the sages say that because Hashem offered the Torah to Esav. He came to Esav and he said, Esav, your whole life you were claiming that you deserve the right of the firstborn. Do you know that the firstborn is supposed to serve God? The firstborn is supposed to be a Kohen? The firstborn is supposed to study the law of God? Would you like to receive the law of God? And Esav and his nation mm -hmm. said to Hashem, 
what is written in that law of God. And Hashem said, well, I'll tell you the hardest thing. If you can manage it, everything else is easy. You're not allowed to kill, not allowed to murder, not allowed to fight unnecessary wars. And Esav, when they heard it, they said, no, 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 it's not for us. We don't need it. It's too hard. We love to kill. We love to murder. We love to fight wars. If you um, study history, any war that was ever fought, there was someone from a sub involved. Any war, there were some descendants or blood mixture of a sub in it. So Hashem said, okay, what can I do? You don't want it. I'm going to go elsewhere. Now, Moshe continues and says, having appeared from Mount Paran. But before Esav, Hashem went somewhere else. And that was to the mountain of Paran. Who lived in the mountain of Paran? And that was Yishmael, the children of Yishmael. That means that before going to the Jewish people, Hashem went to Esav. And before going to Esav, he went to Yishmael. He came to Ishmael and said, Ishmael, I remember that you claimed that you should be the firstborn. You should be the spiritual descendant of Abraham because you were born first from Hagar. Would you like to receive the Torah that will tell you how to serve God? And then maybe you will be firstborn. This is your chance. And Ishmael said, certainly, but let me hear, hear first what does it say in your Torah? And Hashem said, I'm going to tell you the hardest thing for you. If you can handle it, everything else is going to be easy for you. So Hashem said, according to some versions, don't steal. And they said, no, 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 it's too hard for us. As it says in the Torah, ya, bakol, the, 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 the hand of Arabs is in the pocket of everyone. They love to grab things that belong to others. And they said, no, this one thing we cannot do. And according to other uh, versions of the Midrash, they said, Hashem said to them, the hardest thing for you is going to be forbidden relations. Exhibit self-control in moral matters, in marital relations. And they said, no, no, we can't. We want 18 wives, we want 70 wives, we want virgins, we want harem. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, no, it's not for us. So Hashem said, you don't want it? They said, no, we're sorry, we don't want it. So Hashem said, okay, I'm going to go elsewhere. So from Ishmael, he went to Esav, and from Esav, he came to Har Sinai. And then approached the Jewish people with some of the holy myriads many hundreds of thousands of angels were with Hashem. From his right hand, he presented mm -hmm. the Torah of fire to them. Very interesting. Hashem gave them Torah with his right hand, number one. And number two, it's the Torah of fire. The Torah of fire means that just like fire, Torah can either build, you can use fire to purify metals, to burn wood, to produce uh, heat, to cook, to boil water, to turn turbines. Fire is used to run society. So to Torah, if used properly, it will be like that spiritual fire that will drive everything that, that, that goes on in the universe. However, fire can also burn. Fire can hurt. Fire can consume. Fire can destroy. If used improperly, and unfortunately, many people have tried to use mm -hmm. Torah improperly for their own benefit, and they have grabbed the Torah and said it's ours 
we are going to interpret it the way we want. We know that this is what um, early Christians attempted to do. They took the Torah from the Jewish people and they started interpreting it their own way. And even Greeks before the Christians and later the Muslims, each one tried to take the Torah and, and, and twist it and use it as a weapon against the Jewish people themselves. That is the Torah of fire. Hashem gave it to us, and he gave it to us with his right hand. Right hand represents kindness. Right hand also represents what the sages say, Lishem Shamayim, for the sake of heaven. It means that if a person learns Torah for the right reason, in order to find the will of God, and in order to fulfill the will of God, then the Torah becomes the Torah of truth, the Torah of kindness, and the fire that's within the Torah becomes positive, constructive force. If, however, a person learns Torah from the left side, from the left field, he is doing it in order to make himself great, to, in order to make himself famous, in order to earn money or to win an argument, then the Torah becomes negative. The Torah becomes damaging, like uh, a destructive fire. That's the kind of Torah, that's the kind of knowledge that Hashem gave to us. Now, verse 3. Indeed, Moshe says, you, God, loved the tribes greatly. All its holy ones were in your hands and they planted themselves at your feet bearing the yoke of your utterances this is a, a, a beautiful verse that says that hashem loves the jews even when he has to rebuke them punish them god forbid remind them of their forgotten duty you still love the tribes greatly and unfortunately sometimes hashem because of his great love and expectation for the Jewish people, he has to punish them. However, all its holy ones, the holy members of the Jewish people, are in your hands. That means that Hashem guards the tzaddikim, the righteous people, as if he is holding them in his hand. And there is a good reason for it. Because they planted themselves at your feet. They became dedicated to you like children sitting in a circle around their parents, like students sitting in a circle around their teacher and listening to every word, ready to fulfill their desire. And not only that, bearing the yoke of your utterances. They are ready to take the burden on their shoulder and the Jewish people have done it. The righteous among us have suffered you can say they have lived a life of great accomplishment and of uh, sleeping short hours eating very little working very hard for the sake of the community for the sake of the jewish nation for the sake of hashem bearing the yoke of your utterances and uh, another merit that the Jewish people have is that they proclaim verse 4 Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe Morasha Kilat Yaakov, the famous verse the Torah that Moshe commanded us is the heritage of the congregation of Yaakov the Jewish people recognize that the Torah is not man-made material, rather it is divine the Torah that Moshe commanded us is the heritage of the congregation of Yaakov. And they further say in verse 5, he, meaning God, became king over Yeshurun. Yeshurun is the highest name of the Jewish people. Jewish people have three main names. One is Yaakov. That is the name of the Jewish people when they are at the first stage of their history, which is the majority of their history, when they have to struggle, when they have to fight, when they have dark times, then they have Israel, when they have won, 
when they accomplished, when they are on top, they are called Yisrael. And the highest name is Yeshurun. Yeshurun comes from the word Yashar, just like the word Yisrael, Yud Sin Reish, Yeshurun also Yud Shin Reish, both spell out Yashar, means straight to God. But our sages say that the name Yeshurun is the future name of the Jewish people when they become perfect. God became king over the Jewish people who are now called with their highest name Yeshurun. When the numbers of the nation gathered the tribes of Israel in unity. Which means, when does God become the king over the Jewish people, the highest form? When do the Jewish people attain that highest name? That is when they gather all of them in unity. When Jewish people have unity, then Hashem, God, is a king over them. And they are considered by God as having fulfilled their true mission. Because just like a parent who loves to see that his children get along and his children love each other and they help each other, so too Hashem wants to see us, the Jewish people, that we look at each other with uh, happiness. We look at each other with approval. We look at each other with love and we help each other. Now come the blessings. First blessing is to Ruven. May Ruven live and not die. And may his population be included in the count. Now, this is interesting. If he's going to live, then he's not going to die. Why say both? Moshe said, may Ruven live. And he should not die. So the commentators say, may Ruven live a long life in this world. Because when Ruven made a mistake by interfering in his father's marital life and by recommending that his father should move his bed after his wife Rachel died, he should move his bed to Ruven's mother's tent, Leah. Yaakov said, you cannot do that. I choose where I move my tent. I have three more wives and I'm going to choose which one. And Yaakov moved his tent to Bilha's tent, who was Rachel's maidservant. And Reuven, of course, didn't like it, so he interfered. And Yaakov said, you have no right to interfere in your father's marital life. And uh, that was a mistake that Reuven made. However, Moshe says, may Reuven live because Reuven did Teshuvah. He regretted what he did, and he became perfect tzaddik, a righteous man. And Moshe gave him a further blessing. May he not die in the next world. May he not be punished for any of it. Not only he should not be punished by early death, God forbid, he should live his whole life, but not even a remainder, not even a trace of his sin should stay for the next world. May he have Olam Haba. And his population should be included in the count. The tribe of Reuven should not lose the merit of being counted among the Jewish people. Just like when Yaakov gave him the blessing, um, the Jewish people were counted. Right after Reuven made a mistake, the Torah goes out of its way to say, but the tribes of of, of uh, Israel were 12 and Reuven was the firstborn which means the Torah right away says that Hashem forgave him because Reuven did Teshuvah. Now verse 7 the blessing to Yehuda and uh, together with Yehuda Moshe gives blessing to Shimon because Yehuda and Shimon occupied the same territory uh, but Shimon didn't have fields Rather, they were given cities in the territory of Yehuda. And this to Yehuda. And Moshe said, Listen, O Hashem, to Yehuda's voice. May 
Hashem accept the prayers of Yehuda. We, descendants of Yehuda, majority of the Jewish people nowadays come from the tribe of Yehuda, we have this power as well, from the blessing of Moshe. May our prayers be accepted. And return him to his people. When he goes out to war, may he come back without any casualties. May he come back intact to his people. That is why David Hamelech, who comes from Judah, was always victorious. May his hands fight his grievance. May Yehuda always have victory against his enemies. And may you, God, be a helper against his enemies. And may, may God always help Yehuda in war. Now, verse 8, the blessing to Levi. Of Levi, Moshe said, your Tumim, your Urim. He's speaking to Hashem. Hashem, the Urim and Tumim, the special garment of Kohen Gadol that you gave in order to communicate with you. It was um, name of Hashem written on parchment inserted into folded breastplate and through the Jewish people speaking to Hashem, the stones on the breastplate would light up and give the answer. So Moshe says, Hashem, your Urim and Tumim befit their proper for your devout one. Why? Because the tribe of Levi were the most loyal to Hashem in the, that early history. And Moshe lists a few examples where, when the tribe of Levi remained loyal to Hashem, whom you tested at Massa, and whom you challenged at the waters of Meriva. And the one who said of his father and mother, I have not favored them. And his brothers, he did not give recognition and his children, he did not know. For they, the Levites, have observed the word and your covenant they preserved. Now, the earliest mention when the Levites were loyal to Hashem was when the Jewish people came into the land of Israel, uh, into the land of Egypt. The Egyptians asked them, We have priests. Uh, every house of idol worship has their priests. And our priests have a special privilege. They receive a stipend from the government and they don't have to work and they don't have to pay taxes. However, they have to live with that stipend. They cannot do business. They cannot uh, be involved in secular uh, pursuits. Do you have someone like that among you? They asked the Jewish people. Now, the Jewish people were surprised by that question because by us, Every Jew, young or old, is a servant of Hashem. Man or woman, elder or child, we all serve God every day, the whole day. So the Jewish people said, no, we don't have such a thing. We're all equal. However, the Levites said, you know, it wouldn't be nice if we say, no, we don't have. Because the Egyptians are going to misinterpret it and they're going to think that we are all equal in not serving God, that we don't have special tribe that are dedicated to God. They're not going to understand, just like Paro later said, who is mm -hmm. going to serve God when Moshe came to him? And Moshe said, everyone, our elders and our youngsters, our women and our men, everybody's going. Paro said, don't make up stories. Such a thing doesn't exist. It's only a certain limited group of people who are priests, who serve God. Everyone else, the masses, they have no connection to God. So Par couldn't believe it. And the Levites said to the Egypt, to the Jewish people, we must choose someone 
just to look like we also have people who are dedicated to God. So the Levites volunteered and they said, we are such a people. We are going to accept upon ourselves the stipend of power. And even though we can do business and we can become professionals and earn a lot, we are not going to. Because we, for the sake of Hashem, to preserve His uh, glory, Kiddush Hashem, we are going to take upon ourselves to serve Him full time. And because of that, the Levites started receiving the stipend from Egyptians, from Paro, the Egyptian government, and they did not need to participate in the economy. So at the beginning, they were more poor because they couldn't develop fields, they couldn't build, they couldn't have um, animals. They were dedicated to learning Torah and serving God. However, later they, it paid off because whoever was a professional, whoever was in the workforce became a slave to Paro. And they were suffering and their children were um, killed. However, the Levites, because they were the priestly class, so the Egyptians thought, and the, the Levites accepted upon themselves the small stipend of, of, the, of, of Paro, they were not touched. They continued receiving the stipend and they continued having freedom to serve God and living Jewish way of life. That was their first um, sign of loyalty. Then when the Jewish people came out of Egypt, they were tested with, with the golden calf and majority of the Jewish people couldn't pass the test. Um, they doubted, although only a small percent, or only about uh, half a percent of the Jewish people actually served the idol, only 3,000 men out of 600,000 men and no women. So it was uh, much less than 1%, less than half a percent that actually sinned. But many Jews had doubts and worries and concerns where is Moshe was going to be, but not Levites. All the Levite men were loyal to Hashem and they did not have any thoughts of serving idols. So that was another. And further in uh, sending the spies and other complaints that the Jewish people had, the Levites always stood out. So that's what it says that when time came to kill those that served the golden calf, the Levites did not favor their relatives and they went out to support Moshe and they executed those that served um, the idol. Now, verse 10 continues the blessing to the Levites. They shall teach your ordinances to Yaakov and your Torah to Israel. The Levites became the teachers in the Jewish nation. And therefore, in our times, um, those that teach the Torah, those that dedicate themselves to God and to public affairs, they are considered Levites. They're not really Levites, they're not Kohanim, but they serve that role. And therefore, in the, among the Jewish people, they are relieved of taxes. Because they dedicate their whole life. They don't do business. They don't become professionals. Rather, they uh, give up their independence and they serve the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation has to take care of them. They shall place incense before your presence. Part of Levites became Kohanim, the priests in the temple, Beit HaMikdash. And they <clears throat> offered incense and burnt offerings on your altar. Bless, O oh Hashem, his resources. Hashem, please give wealth to the Levites. 
because we, as we said, Levites didn't do business. They uh, didn't pursue secular careers. And therefore, Moshe gives them a special blessing from Hashem that their Parnassah should come clearly from God and not due to their own effort. And favor the work of his hand. Accept their service in Beit HaMikdash. Smash the loins of his foes and his enemies that they may not rise. And may the Levites be victorious in war. When do we see that the, the uh, Levites fought the war? That we see in the story of Hanukkah, the Maccabim. They were a family of Kohanim. They fought and they were victorious. And this blessing of Moshe is uh, alluding to that. Smash his enemies and may they not rise. The next blessing is to the tribe of Binyamin. Verse 12, of Binyamin he said, may Hashem's beloved dwell securely by him, by God. Binyamin is called God's beloved because the, the Talmud tells us that Binyamin always wished and dreamed to be the one in whose portion the Beit HaMikdash will be built. And Moshe gives him this blessing. May you who are God's beloved always dwell securely next to God. God hovers over him all day long. When the temple will be built in the land of Binyamin, part of Jerusalem where the temple stood was in the um, land of Binyamin. And God's presence, the cloud of glory, hovered over the temple. That is why it says he hovers over him all day long and rests between his shoulders. Next blessing is for Yosef. Blessed by Hashem is his land. With the heavenly bounty of dew and the deep waters crouching below. The land of Yosef had a lot of sources of water. It had dew. It had springs. With the bounty of the sun's crop, they had abundant sunlight and with the bounty of the moon's yield. They had quickly ripening grains and with quick ripening crops of the early mountains, the fruit trees in the, in the land of Yosef also gave fruit very early and with the bounty of eternal hills and the land of Yosef produces fruit even in drought. That's why they're called eternal hills. They produce fruit even when other lands have stopped. With the bounty of the land and its fullness, the land of Yosef had variety of fruits, great variety, more than any other land. And by the favor of him who rested upon the thorn bush, which, which refers to Hashem, the favor of Hashem is resting on the tribe of Yosef. May this blessing rest upon Yosef's head and upon the crown of him who was separated from his brothers. Yosef, as we remember, was uh, sold and lived far away from his family. That's what it says, was separated from his brothers. This word also means the crown of his brothers because Yosef was king over Egypt as well as all the Jewish people for um, 80 years from age 30 until age 110. And the uh, descendant of Yosef became a king again, Yoshua, and later they had other kings. A sovereignty is his ox-like one, that descendants of Yosef will be powerful leaders. An example is Yoshua. Majesty is his, and his glory will be like the horns of Re'em. Re, the horns of Re'em, a beautiful, um, beautiful 
um, long horns. This is the blessing of beauty that uh, Moshe gives to Yosef. With them shall he gore nations together. Yosef in the future will have victory over um, other nations. This came true in times of Yehoshua when they conquered 31 kings, as well as, as it says, to the ends of the land. Later, the uh, children of children of Yosef were victorious in other wars. And in times of Mashiach, we have a tradition that there will be first a leader, a Mashiach from Yosef, who will fight against the nations. And then he will be uh, replaced by Mashiach from the tribe of uh, um, Yehuda, the, from the um, lineage of David Amelech, who will finish the job and bring um, all the nations under one God. They are the myriads of Ephraim, which means tens of thousands that children of Ephraim killed in war, and the thousands of Minashe. Since the tribe of Yosef was split into two tribes, Ephraim and Minashe, both are mentioned. Now, next blessing is to Zivulun and Yisachar. And they're mentioned together because they were partners. Zivulun and Yisachar made partnership that Zivulun will do business and will support Yisachar, who dedicated himself to Torah study. Of Zivulun, he said, Rejoice, O Zivulun, in your excursions, in your business trips. Zivulun is blessed with success in business. And Yisachar, in your tents. And Yisachar is blessed with success in Torah, Torah study. Now, verse 19 explains the success of Yisachar and Zebulun. The tribes will assemble at the mount. The Jewish people will come to Jerusalem based on the calculations of the tribe of Yisachar who using their Torah wisdom, were able to calculate precise dates for all the Jewish holidays. They established the calendar. There they will slaughter offerings of righteousness. And when all the Jewish people assemble in Jerusalem on Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, they will be able to bring, bring offerings. Another interpretation is that we're talking about the success of Zebulun. The na nations will assemble at the mountain, meaning when all the nations of the world will come to the land of Israel to do business with Zebulun, who were very successful merchants, once they come to the land of Israel, they will say, you know what? Let's visit the capital. Let's visit the place where they serve their God. And they will assemble at the mountain, mountain where Beit HaMikdash is, and there they will slaughter offerings of righteousness. The goyim will be so inspired. Nations of the world will see that the Jewish people are serving one God, indivisible, together. Unlike nations where they have multiple gods, multiple religions, and they're all fighting each other, they will see unity. They will see that we believe in one unified God and they will request to become Jewish, to join the Jewish nation. They will become righteous convert, converts and they will bring their offerings right then and there. On the spot, they will decide to be, become Jewish. For by the riches of the sea, they will be nourished. The tribe of Zevulun is blessed with a successful fishing industry and uh, doing business overseas using ships. And by the treasures concealed in the sand, the tribe of Zivulun also uh, was blessed with pearls and techelet that 
um, is produced from chilazon that, that comes out from the sea, both the pearls and techele, the blue dye that we use to color our tzitzit. Next is the blessing for God, the tribe of God. Blessed is he, blessed is God, Hashem, who broadens the tribe of God, gives them wide land. The tribe of God uh, went out and conquered additional land in addition to what they received. He dwells like a lion. They will have a strong army, tearing off arm and even head. They had powerful warriors who, with one blow with their sword, would slice the enemy with his uh, head and neck and his torso and his arm. They wouldn't chop off his head. They would chop him in half. And when the Jewish people would see a slain enemy with his head, neck, torso, and arm chopped, slanted all the way, they would know that a warrior from God sliced him up. Now Moshe gives a prediction. He chose the first portion for himself, for that is where the lawgiver's plot is hidden. The tribe of God chose for themselves area where the mountain of Nevo is. That is where Moshe will be buried. This is a prophetic um, blessing because Moshe didn't die yet and Moshe doesn't know yet where he's going to die. And children of God already requested or will request that portion. They will say, we want the land where our leader Moshe is buried. He came at the head of the nation. The, uh, warriors in the tribe from the tribe of God were leaders in war at the head of the nation, carrying out Hashem's justice and his ordinances with Israel. Now, the next blessing is for Dan. Of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion cub. He will have a strong army, like a lion, leaping forth from the Bashan. They lived in Bashan, and from there they went forth to fight wars for the Jewish people. Next blessing is for Naphtali. Of Naphtali, Moshe said, Naphtali, satiated with favor, they will have bountiful land. They are filled with Hashem's blessing. Go possess the sea and its so south shore. The sea here refers to the Kinneret Lake. And the southern shore of Kinneret belonged to Naphtali. Next blessing is Asher. Of Asher, he said, <clears throat> the most blessed of children is Asher. Asher is blessed with many children, good children. He shall be pleasing to his brothers and dip, dip his feet in oil. The land of Asher had abundant um, olive trees from which they produced a lot of olive oil. Now, the blessing for the entire Jewish people in verse 25. Moshe is now speaking to all the tribes. May your borders be sealed like iron and copper. May the Jewish people have security in their land. And like the days of your youth, so may your old age be. Good old age of the Jewish people, which means just like in times of Moshe and Yehoshua, our prime, we were successful, we were together, we were united. Later, things were not so good. The Jewish people fell off, they rebelled, they uh, split. May our old age be like our prime. May at the end of days, Jewish people come again together under the, our King Mashiach. And we may we again have unity um, and security. Now, Moshe speaks on behalf of the Jewish people. 
There is none like God or Yeshurun. He, God, rides across heaven to help you. Hashem, don't think that he's far away. Don't think that Hashem doesn't see. In a split second, you can be helped. As if from one end of the universe to another, Hashem, Hashem's help is always near. He is the shield of your help. The shield means that he will protect you from attacks. Not only after the trouble comes, he will save you, extricate you, but he will shield you. He will protect you so that no trouble comes to you at all. And in his majesty through the upper heights. Now, verse 27. That is the abode of God immemorial, which means the heaven or the spiritual dimension, what we cannot see, is the abode of Hashem always. And below, which means the universe that we can see, the physical world, are the world's mighty ones. The kings, and the warriors, the generals, they think they own the world. They can conquer lands and they think we are powerful but really they are blind they don't understand what's going on mm. they are just like pawns they are just like uh, mm. uh, tools in god's hands and god controls the whole history he drove the enemy away from before you hashem flicks our enemies away and he said destroy with just his words, he can destroy our enemies. Thus, in the future, Yisrael, the Jewish people, shall dwell secure, solitary, and they are going to be alone. No other nation will join them. Individuals will join, but not nations. Solitary, alone, in the likeness of Yaakov. Like the blessing that Yaakov gave them are Moshe's blessings in a land of grain and wine, even his heavens shall drip with dew. This is the blessing that we always have in the land of Israel. Whenever the Jewish people are in the land of Israel, the land becomes fertile. It turns from being a desert into a beautiful garden. Fortunate are you, O Israel, who is like you? O oh, people delivered by Hashem, the shield of your help, who is the sword of your grandeur. Your enemies will try to deceive you, but you will trample their haughty ones. At the end, Jewish people will be victorious. We just have to be calm and patient until the right time comes. Now, chapter the, the blessing finished, and now chapter 34. This is the last uh, chapter of the Torah. Moshe ascended from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo. As we mentioned, Mount Nebo is the mountain where Moshe, for the last time, looked over the entire land of Israel. And he died on that mountain. To the summit, to the highest point of the cliff that faces Yericho. And Hashem showed him the entire land, both then and in the future. For the next almost 4,000 years, Moshe saw into the future what's going to happen to the land of Israel, what's going to happen to the Jewish people. The Gilad, as far as done, he saw both the good times and the bad times. The times when the Jewish people did Avodah Zarah, they served idols in the tribe of Dan, as well as the victories of Shimshon. And he saw all of Naphtali, and he saw the war against Sisera and the Jewish victory over Sisera. And the land of Ephraim, he saw wars that Yehoshua, who is from the tribe of Ephraim, fought for the Jewish people and won. And Menashe the victories of Gidon against Midian and Amalek. And he saw the entire land of Yehuda, both present and future. 
wars that David HaMelech fought and won as far as the Western Sea. Western Sea is the Mediterranean Sea, which means Moshe was standing on the other side of uh, Jordan River, and he saw all the way till the Western Sea, the Mediterranean. However, in Hebrew, this word Hayam Aharon can also be read as Hayom Aharon, the last day. Moshe saw the whole history until the last day of this world's existence. He saw the entire history of humanity. Negev, southern part of the land of Israel, as well as Marata Machpila, with the graves of our forefathers, and the plain, the mm -hmm. plain where Shalomo HaMelech built, uh, was uh, preparing tools mm -hmm. for the construction of Beit HaMikdash. The valley of Yericho, city of date palms, as far as Tzoa. Now, verse 4. And Hashem said to him, this is the land which I swore to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Now that Moshe saw Maratha Machpelah, Hebron, the burial place of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Hashem reminded him, I promised to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov that I will give this land to the Jewish people. And a lot of years have passed. And now came time for me to fulfill my promise. Please go to... Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov in the next world, in Olam Abba, and tell them that I have fulfilled my promise. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Go and tell the forefathers that although I, Moshe, cannot go there, I have to die here, but Dear Abraham, dear Yitzhak, and dear Yaakov, I am here to tell you that the promise of Hashem was fulfilled and the Jewish people crossed over into the land. You can greet your great-grandchildren again. They are back home. So Moshe, servant of Hashem, died there. In the land of Moab, by the mouth of Hashem. Now, the Jewish people are unique. And they, they do not try to deify their leaders. We do not claim that our leaders, when they die, they really didn't die. Really, they became angels. Really, they became God. God forbid. Rather, we say, when our leaders die, they just die. And they are buried. As it says, Moshe died there by the mouth of Hashem and he buried him in the depression. Who buried him? Hashem buried him or according to some, Moshe buried himself. But we don't say he went to heaven alive. He became an angel or God, God forbid. And that is the a further proof that the Torah is true because I don't know of other religions where they treat their leaders as regular people. They try to boost themselves up and say, oh, our leader is special. Whereas we say, Moshe had a, a body of a human being, and therefore he had to die like every other human being. And therefore his body had to be buried like the body of every other human being. In the land of Moab, he was buried opposite of Beit Peor, and no one knows his burial place to this day. Although no one knows the burial place to this day, so we could have easily used this fact that no one knows where he's buried to invent a claim that since we don't know where he's buried, must be he's not buried. Since we don't have his body, must be he just floated away into heaven. We don't say that. We say, no, no, no. He is buried. We just don't know where he is. But definitely he is on earth buried. And as much as people try to locate the site of, of um, Moshe's uh, grave, no one was successful. 
Verse 7. Moshe was 120 years old when he died. His eyes had not dimmed. Even after he died, he had a clear vision. And his vigor had not diminished. His body did not decompose. We have a tradition that tzaddikim, righteous people, who use their body properly, only for good, their body doesn't decompose. Specifically, if they do not have any feelings of jealousy uh, towards others, they, they, their body is impervious to worms and decomposition. The, now, why did Moshe die? He didn't die from old age, not because he became blind, he became lame, he couldn't move, he became paralyzed, God forbid. No, he was as, as, as if he was still a young man. The only reason why he died was because God said he must die. Now, the children of Israel cried for Moshe in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the days of tearful mourning for Moshe ended. Moshe passed away on the 7th of Adar, and until 7th of Nisan, the Jewish people cried for Moshe. Then they prepared on the 7th of Nisan uh, for the crossing, and on the 10th of Nisan, three days later, they crossed into the land of Israel. Yehoshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moshe had laid his hands upon him. So the children of Israel obeyed him and did as Hashem had commanded Moshe. Yoshua becomes the new leader. Now, there's an argument. Who wrote these last few lines from verse 5 and on? About Moshe's death, his burial, and Yoshua become the new leader. Some say Moshe died and Yoshua wrote it instead of Moshe. And some say Hashem dictated these last few verses to Moshe in the prophecy, and Moshe wrote them down before they happened, which means Moshe wrote down about his own death. Verse 10. Never again has there arisen in Israel a prophet like Moshe, whom Hashem had known face to face. Moshe's prophecy is unique, and uh, no other prophet had such clarity, and no other prophet had such access to Hashem. Moshe could see God whenever he wanted, and the message that he received from God was clear, unobstructed. Other prophets, they have to interpret what they saw. And they have to say it over in their own words. With Moshe, whatever he said was the direct message from Hashem. As evidenced by all the signs and wonders that Hashem sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Paro and all his courtiers and all his land, all the miracles and the 10 plagues that Moshe performed in Egypt and by, the, by all the strong hand when Moshe received the tablets and he brought them down with his hand and awesome power that Moshe performed, all the miracles that Moshe made in the desert, bringing out water and fighting wars and bringing down the man, leading the Jewish people for 40 years that Moshe performed before the eyes of all Israel. And even the fact that Moshe broke the first set of tablets was something miraculous. And that proved that whatever he did was from Hashem. Because who in his right mind would take the message that God gave him, the Ten Commandments, and smash them? From that act, the Jewish people were shocked. And they said, it must be that Moshe actually it receives the message from God and gives it to us clearly. And they were shocked that Moshe smashed the tablets. 
And Hashem came and said, yes, Moshe, thank you for smashing the tablets. You fulfilled my desire. And of course, we know the story later. Moshe prayed and Hashem gave them a new set of tablets. But all the miracles in Egypt, in the desert, and by Mount Sinai proved conclusively that Moshe was the, the prophet of God, the topmost, highest quality. Never again such a prophet arose. And this concludes Parshat Vezot Abaracha, and that con this concludes the entire five books of Moshe. Chazak, chazak, venit chazek, be strong, may we be strong, and may we be strengthened. Mm -hmm. Mazal tov uh, for finishing the uh, Torah. May we merit to start and finish it many times over. And may we go to other books of Torah and may we finish the entire mm -hmm. written and oral Torah. May everyone be sealed in the book of life and may we have a successful year and hug Samer. Thank you for joining us. All the best.